And this is my capstone. I set out uh, to design an autonomous thrust vector control system for model rockets. You might ask why, what problem does it solve, and what is a thrust vector control system? <laughs> Um, well, a thrust vector control system is a way to stabilize a rocket in flight or in descent too. It's, uh, it has a set point for the rocket, which is typically pointy end up, clammy end down. And if it goes uh, deviates from that, it adjusts the, the way the thrust push to get it back to its set point. Now, why would I, what, what problem does that solve exactly? Well, model rockets are supposed to model rockets. And right now, if you go shopping for a model rocket, Every one of the kits you find online use passive stabilization, which is what fins are. And that's uh, not exactly what happens. Actually, that's not what happens at all in true rockets. They use thrust vector control along with other systems to stabilize themselves while they're in flight. And this uh, is a problem because if kids start learning about rockets through models, they're learning the wrong things. They're solving problems that aren't being solved in actual rocketry. But there's a solution to that. And I set out to create uh, a system to do that. I set some goals for myself. Just like any rocket launch, you want it to be successful. If it's a hobby, you want it to be accessible. So under $200 was my goal. And I really wanted it to be like an actual rocket. So that has to mean it takes off at a slower rate, which is what the thrust to weight ratio is, than uh, what normal rockets do with fins. In order for uh, passive stabilization fins to work, you have to launch it at 30 feet per second which uh, is not what actual rockets do. And of course, uh, I wanted to recover it not broken too. That's uh, uh, important. <laughs> um, so I set out to create a system, design that, and just like any good mechatronic system, it has a series of inputs. The inputs I needed was uh, necessary in order to understand the orientation of the rocket at any given time. So there's a couple breakout boards that contain accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, barometers, and at the very end there, a push button. And that's so there could be some human intervention for a safety reason. And then of course, uh, those were uh, controlled by the computer and sent codes to the outputs, which uh, were a couple servos. Those were used to adjust the angle of the thrust on the lower gimbal, which I have displayed here. <laughs> um, and then of course, uh, a couple ways to light the ignitions uh, were e matches. And a LED and buzzer was used to understand what state the computer was in without plugging a computer into the computer. And what I mean is uh, my computer was an Arduino Nano. It's small, lightweight, and it fit the project well for that reason. And it allowed a large uh, variety of coding. It's very versatile. And uh, in that coding, some of the most important parts of that was filtering the data I was receiving. Those sensors I showed you before uh, create a lot of noise. They're really sensitive. And this system vibrates a lot during its functionality, and that uh, creates a lot of noise in it. And then the PID controller is used to give a, a correct correction signal that uh, works with really dynamic systems like the rocket. <laughs> we did a demonstration yesterday with uh, uh, Mike here about that, but uh, for time, I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna go into a little extra information we didn't go over yesterday, which is data filtering. This was absolutely necessary for the project because uh, You'll see in a second what the data looks like unfiltered versus filtered. But so there's a couple, there's a large variety of ways to kind of attack this problem. I chose three of them, complementary filters, a Kalman filter, and sensor fusion, which combines the different sensor data into a more accurate representation of what's actually happening. Um, and you don't need to know much about these other than you have lots of choices if you ever have to filter data. These are just three of them that work best for my project. They're all adjustable and they're all kind of unique in their own ways to, to, for each different system, because every system's different. This right here is an example of noisy data on the blue line there. This is driving in a vehicle, or uh, as a passenger, uh, recording the data from just the noise of the vehicle while moving the rocket about three or four degrees, which is like this. And this is the data from the accelerometer. I kind of cheated. Uh, this is, the red line's also using other sensors as well. But you can see the red line here is a lot smoother than the blue line. It's able to calculate and kind of sift through all that noise and give a signal that's readable and has good data. Uh, that's huge because the next step of that is feeding it into a control system. My control system I use is a PIE system, which is a way to kind of uh, control a very complex uh, dynamic system 
and, and, uh, and get to a set point for your, well, I'll say for my rocket. So a set point for my rocket was pointy end up, flamey end down, which is straight up. And the way the PIE system helps with that is it has a, uh, that set point and then it calculates your air rate based off that set point. So if it deviates from that five degrees, it calculates that as five degrees and then it puts it into um, a correction system, the PID. This is typically what my rocket would do, best case scenario, if it didn't have a control system. As soon as it passed one way, which is what's uh, happening right here, it would adjust its thrust to start going towards that set point and continue until it reached it. Once it reached it though, because it's a dynamic system, it would continue right past it. Once it continued past it, it would start sending its thrusters the other way and you get this oscillation effect. That's not great for rocket flight and that's not what I uh, wanted to happen. So by incorporating the PID system, there's three parts to it. We start with the proportional part of it. It takes the data from the sensor and it gives a proportional response, which means that uh, the stronger the air, the stronger the response that it's gonna get. So at this point, it's a large air, it's gonna respond quicker. But this inher inherently has a problem as well because if it's proportional, let's say it corrects it halfway every time, you never get to the actual point you wanna be at. So that's where the eye comes in, the impact and scroll. And that's really cool because it actually takes the magnitude and how long that uh, air has been occurring and gives a response that's mixed with the proportional response. That solves this problem because for example, if we had a short period of time with a high magnitude of air, then it would increase its reaction. And that's why we get faster to the set point here. Or what we had before where it never got to the set point, if it's a low magnitude of air over a long period of time, it also increases the reaction to that. So that still doesn't solve everything because as we're going to see, there's, there's systems that would still have oscillations, and mine definitely did. So then you can put in the derivative uh, function of that, which if you put all three together, hopefully, hopefully gives you an orange line like this. Uh, but this one's really cool because it is able to predict what's gonna happen on the response. You can see these are, the red, uh, black line here is the proportional and the integral together, but the D kind of predicts what's gonna happen next by looking at the slope of this reaction. So if it's responding quickly, it says, oh wow, we're gonna go past that set point very quickly, so it kind of dampens that response. With all three together, you can tune these to make your system more stable, and uh, that's uh, definitely what needed to happen. Uh, so my design, um, my project was in three different steps. I designed different pieces. And you can see I have three different zone here. I had a flight computer. And then I'm just gonna skip right to the next part, which is the testing stage. On the testing part, ooh, um, I won't play the videos again, we've all seen them, but uh, what was cool was I got this light of fire <laughs> with the permission of TCI <laughs> in the parking lot. And uh, this was testing them piece by piece before I integrated everything. This test proved that the gimbal could withstand the thrust of the engine and that the servos could also move at the same time. And uh, we did some other testing as well. And then of course, super important was testing my flight computer before soldering it all together. Because once you solder it together, it's a lot harder to uh, take it apart <laughs> than an easy breadboard like that. The third stage of that is integrating everything into the system and making sure it works all together. And that's what I did. And I did it successfully for about one and a half times. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited when it started happening and of course heartbroken when I noticed it wasn't working over time. I couldn't understand, but after spending about half a day troubleshooting, I realized I killed my LiPo battery, the main power source. The computer was wired together to run off the LiPo battery and now it doesn't uh, work anymore. So I went to troubleshooting, I went to some hobby stores, and I learned that almost every flight computer that you buy has something called a low voltage cutoff circuit built into it. And what that does is, well, it saves your battery from dying. When it gets low enough, it turns it off as if it was dead, but you're able to recharge it again. Mine was unable to be recharged one week before my project. My computer didn't have enough time to be redesigned and resoldered before this week of presentation. And I realized I wasn't gonna make it to the finish line I thought I was gonna make it to. And with that came a little despair. This oh. is <laughs> the moment I realized it wasn't going to happen. Oh. But that's okay, because it was never about reaching the finish line. That's not stage at all. 
Uh, <laughs> it was about a learning experience, learning about myself, and learning a lot of uh, different things to get to the, uh, towards the end of the project. Here's a revisit of my goals I set. Two of them were accomplished. I did use no bins. It was under $200. And ultimately, I learned a ton in this project. Uh, but the main things I really learned was about myself, and that's I could accomplish really, really hard goals if I did divide them into smaller, easier goals. And it felt great to get those each time. There's one thing also I learned uh, is how to deal with frustration and overcome it. I remember at one point uh, when I had troubles with my servos, this was in the beginning, it wasn't even the hardest project or a problem to solve. I, I remember getting so frustrated, my ears started ringing. Oh, I, I've never been that frustrated <laughs> in my life. Uh, and that was an experience, and uh, I felt that I couldn't focus that day. I missed a complete lecture about AC uh, currents, and um, I had to catch up on that later. <laughs> but uh, I thought to myself, well, that's a problem if I get that frustrated. How can I deal with that? Took a break, revisited it, and, um, and when I ran into other problems later on in the future, I was used to that feeling. And at the very end, by the time I ran into a lipo problem, I didn't really feel frustrated. Uh, it was more just acceptance of this is where I'm at and now I have to overcome this part. And that's where I plan to go, is to continue. From here, I plan to finish that new flight computer with the low voltage cutoff circuit. I plan to test my full system integrated again with my engines in there, fine tune the PIE system, and I plan to launch it and show every one of you it launched. Uh, I know some people want to come too. Uh, thank you for my presentation. For giving my presentation. tomorrow with my PID system and it will be working plugged into the wall. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm replacing the battery with the wall outlet.